Welcome to the Dylan Show. Good morning and welcome all to the show. Uh, it's been a little bit, but I appreciate you guys for still tuning in with me. It uh, means a lot for your continued support, and I've gained a lot of connections throughout the show over the past couple weeks, so thank you guys for reaching out and talking with me about the show. Uh, I don't want to waste too much time, um, so please help me welcome our guest this morning, Mr. Rick Cleveland. <laughs> Uh, first off, uh, I, I want to let everyone know I am at the University of Mississippi and I attended a Title IX event just a couple weeks ago. Uh, Mr. Cleveland was one of the narrators for the speakers there and I just happened to approach him afterwards and get his contact information and it's just been an honor to talk to him so far. Um, so first off, Mr. Cleveland, uh, just how are you doing right now? And I, I know we, you got a lot going on, but how's life treating you right now? Oh, everything's great. We uh, we're pretty much through the water crisis down here mm -hmm. uh, in Jackson, and you know it's the middle of football season. I wish it was a little bit cooler for September, mm -hmm. but we're <laughs> we're not there yet. But other than that, everything's fine. That's good to hear. I know. Um, how long has I, I know it's been a couple of weeks, but how has it been in Jackson? Just with the water functioning like it is, and well, you know, it's just been we. Uh, it, I live in Fondren. I don't know how much you know about Jackson, but I live uh, in one of the older parts of the city. Beautiful area. Um, it's we have never lost our water pressure we've just been told not to uh not to drink it mm -hmm. so uh, i've gotten really really proficient at, at boiling water right uh, it's you know it's it is what it is it's we just we, we we've made the best of it and uh you know it's been it's been nice how other parts of the state and other parts of the country have uh you know, uh, there are water stations all over town where you could pick up bottled water and everything. It's, uh, it's been okay. Well, we, we send our prayers and love to you guys down there. Uh, we, I mean, we hope, you know, it gets better as quickly as possible. I know that can obviously be a life altering event for some. So we wish the best for you guys. Well, um, we're, we're going to make it. Mr. Cleveland, uh, I always, allow my guests to introduce themselves for the people that are listening or watching that may not know a lot about you. Um, so just give them, talk about where you're from, uh, just some things you've been able to accomplish to help you get where you are today. Well, I grew up in Hattiesburg. Um, both, of, uh, both of my parents worked at the university there. My dad was in the athletic department. And my, my mother ran the uh, bookstore on the campus and uh actually when i was a little little bitty boy my dad and mom were the uh proctors of the what was called the old rock it was the dormitory underneath the uh football stadium mm -hmm. so i had the um the football field was actually my backyard uh right across the street was the what was then the the gymnasium for uh southern miss and to the north side was the uh baseball diamond and uh just to the uh on the other side of this of the stadium was was a uh swimming pool so it you know for a little little sports nut it was, mm -hmm. it was a pretty, pretty nice place to, to grow up. And it's not any, I don't think it's any upset that, that sports became my livelihood, you know, sports and books and journalism. And, um, so, uh, that's, that was early. I, I went, uh, you know, I had full intentions of being a major league shortstop and, Found out about age 12, 13 when they started throwing curveballs that that wasn't going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, my dad had been a sports writer before he worked at the university. And uh, in fact, he was the sports editor of the Hattiesburg American when I was born. And uh, we always had a lot of sports writers 
that came to the house after games and stuff. Mm -hmm. And man, it just seemed like they were having a really good time. They were having a lot better, a lot more fun than the, than the, uh, doctors and lawyers and the, um, you know, professors and plumbers and everybody else that I encountered. And I decided I was going to be a sports writer. And, uh, so when I was, when I was about 13 years old, I, I contacted the local newspaper, the Hattiesburg American, to ask them if they needed a, needed a, somebody to cover games, somebody to, you know, I guess what, what, what we called it back then was a stringer. Mm -hmm. somebody to cover the games that weren't important enough for the regular staffers to cover and I so I started doing that when I was 13 years old and uh hell that's that's almost 50 that's 56 57 years ago so I've been doing it for a long time you Talk to me about how when I started the show at 15 and you just talked about how you got into this at 13, how much courage did it, even, did it take to even reach out to the local newspaper? How much courage did it take to just go out there and do something even at that young of an age? I don't know. I guess I thought all, the only thing they can do is tell me no. Mm -hmm. And um <laughs> I don't want this to sound the wrong way. I read the stories in the newspaper. I, I knew I could do what they were doing. Uh, I was, a, besides sports, I was always really interested in, in um, reading and, and writing and books. And, and right. we had, at, at, our, at our home, when I was growing up, we, we took five newspapers at the house. We had... They, you know, news, newspapers were a lot more a part of of life back then. We took mm -hmm. the we took two Jackson papers, the Hattiesburg paper, a New Orleans paper, and a Mobile paper. So, I you know I I was exposed to it. I loved to read it. I thought I could write it. I, I don't know that it took much courage. It took a lot of support from my parents because you know I couldn't drive. Mm -hmm. So a lot, right. a lot of times, so the, the first game I covered for the Hattiesburg American was uh, a game between Brooklyn and Loosedale, and it was at Loosedale, was sixty miles away. So, you know, my daddy had to take me and uh, and uh, stay with me during the game, and so I was very, very fortunate in that regard, and. Uh, I got to tell you, I just loved it. I mean, I just, I loved everything about it. And, uh, and, uh, still, st I still do, you know, people ask me all the time, do you ever get tired of going to games for a living? And, um, uh, the answer is no, because every, you know, every game is different. Every game is, uh, it's different, you know, it's usually different people. It's a different scenario. There's something different always happens. Um, I, I just, uh, I never, I never have gotten tired of it. Now there's some games I wish I could, that I've gone to that I wish I could flip the channel and watch another, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, you, you find, you find the most interesting things about each one and you try to tell the people uh tell the people what happened and um uh, you know i went to one i uh, went saturday and watched uh grambling and and jackson state and was uh really into it really enjoyed it and uh you know looking forward to another one saturday i love that you talk about that something that i advocate a lot is doing something you love because it won't feel like work um, and I've been doing this for so long and I just love it. And so it doesn't feel like work, even when you're putting so much time and effort into it. You know, that's what I told both of my children, uh, who are grown now is, um, you know, my one advice to you about what you do for a living, make sure it's something you love, because if it's not, that's why they call it work. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, so yeah, it's, it's. I did a, 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 
a um, commencement address at uh, my alma mater, Southern, Southern Miss, about seven or eight years ago, and that was that was my my uh, message. You know, do do something. Hopefully, you've chosen something and will do something you love because you'll never regret it if you do. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Mr. Cleveland, talk about um, your parents growing up and the impact that they made on you. I know your father, you talk about was a sports writer and he's a part of the Mississippi Sports Hall of Fame, just like you. What impact did they make on you to keep you on the right pathway down in life? Well, they were, they were supportive, um, uh, in everything. Um, they, um, uh, um, you know, my dad was gone a lot because he traveled a lot with, uh, with his job. And so my mother was very important. My, everybody always makes the assumption that because my father was a, a, a pretty, successful and um well-known sports figure that he had a by far the most impact on it but you know my mother was there all the time she she was the one that took me to little league games i, I remember uh, in hattiesburg they had something called the morning league which was for kids that weren't old enough to it was before t-ball you know mm -hmm. and it was for kids that weren't old enough to play um little league ball or weren't good enough to make one of the little league teams back then not everybody made a team so in in the morning league when i was seven years old there would be times that uh it'd be you know uh, not a pleasant morning raining or sprinkling or something like that and she'd be the only one in the stands and i I'm, I'm, you know never 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 ever forgotten that uh they were um, they were just supportive, and they love you know. And they, I always had I always had support, and I always had love. And you know, what else is there? You know. In high school, what did you try to emphasize in yourself to make sure you were set up right after high school? Like what did what were things that you took steps in to make sure you were the best writer you could possibly be after you graduated? Um, you know, here's the deal with me, and it's different than it is with a lot of people. I, I was already, I was already working at mm -hmm. the newspaper in high school, so I mean, I knew what I was going to do. I mean, mm -hmm. I knew exactly what I was. I knew what I was going to do when I was in this seventh or eighth grade um i uh you know I, I went and helped them we we had an afternoon newspaper in hattiesburg so that meant that most of the work was done starting at 6 a.m and you pretty much had the paper done by nine well i, I went in before school i went in at 6 a.m and helped them put out the the afternoon newspaper um uh so you know as far as preparing i i gotta tell you i mean i i took the other subjects like you know like everybody else french biology <laughs> um algebra two all, all that stuff um the, what i excelled in though though was was english and and when they offered journalism obviously that yeah and history. I was a big history buff. So algebra, not so much. Biology, not so much. Uh, but uh, but that, I, I mean, I, I certainly is not the advice I would give to any student now. Uh, I mean, you want to be well-rounded. You want to be able to do, uh, to know as much as you can know about everything. Uh, mm -hmm. But those were the things that interested me, and those were the things that I was good at. And I did work, you know, I did uh, at the same time I was working at the, the city newspaper. I also worked for the high school. I was editor, you know, editor of the high school uh, paper and all that. So, but yeah, pretty much. And I read, I, I was, 
I, that's the one thing I've always done, still do, is I try to try to try to read a lot. For not only myself, but people who are aspiring to be in the journalism field, how important are things such as reading and writing? Well, for me, it's been in, you know just about everything. Um, I I um, if you if you read <clears throat> and you read good stuff, you're never bored, you know, mm. and you're always learning. Yeah. Uh, you're learning everything. I, I read, uh, you know, the, uh, the the newspaper I read now is the New York Times, and I, I read it uh, every day. Read, read, uh, I, I read, uh, I get most of my sports stuff. I read The Athletic. Are you familiar with the? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the Athletic is what I read, and I, I, I uh, you know, I read the I read the good magazines. I, I uh, the New Yorker. I read uh, Sports Illustrated. Uh, um, but yeah, I just uh, I can't imagine life without books. Bless you. Thank you. Um, I want to ask you. You've been covering sports for so long. Has there been a particular player that? It's just always stuck with you, and you were like that. That's always been my favorite player to watch or cover. Well, growing up, growing up, it was uh, it was uh, Mickey Mantle and Willie Mays. Okay, oh, I, like yeah, I mean uh, they were they were the two uh, in in the National League. I, I was I, I love the Giants back then. Uh, mm -hmm. I love Mays. Um, uh, Jim Davenport, who was their third baseman and later a manager, later their manager had was one of my dad's really good friends. Had played at at Southern Miss, and uh, we used to go whenever the Giants played in uh, in Houston. We would go over there, and you know we were down in the clubhouse with Willie Mays and uh, Willie McCovey. Uh, Juan Marichal, John, uh, um, and Jim, da Jim Davenport. And so, uh, and then in, in the, I was also a Yankee fan. Funny story. I was born on the, uh, uh, day of the seventh game of the 1952 world series. And my, my mother was a big Yankees fan. And she wanted to back then, you know, what well, games weren't on TV. She wanted to listen to it on the radio. She always would tell me that I wouldn't wait. So she missed game seven of the World Series, and um, Mickey Mickey hit a home run. So wow. later on in life, I got to caddy. I caddied for him in a golf tournament in Hattiesburg, uh, at the old Magnolia Classic, which has become the uh, the. It was a PGA satellite tournament now now it's a regular tour tournament here in jackson but uh, i caddied for him in the pro-am so those were my two guys growing up um uh, you know i as i've as i've grown older and been involved in mississippi sports i've always been, uh, loved the and rooted for the mississippi athletes um uh, uh, and gotten to know them, you know, uh, uh, Arch, Archie Manning, uh, yeah. was, uh, not only one of the greatest athletes I've ever covered, but also one of the best pe people I've ever covered. Uh, just a wonderful, wonderful human being. Um, uh, um, uh, Walter Payton, I covered as a, when he was a 17 year old, senior halfback at Columbia High School uh, on the first integrated Columbia High football team. Uh, uh, you know, Jerry Rice. I mean, just, the, you know, we've got such an in, incredible tradition in Mississippi of producing some of the greatest athletes in the world. Yeah. Uh, you know, 
I remember watching Ralph Boston from Laurel uh, jump in the 1964 Olympics in black and white on TV. Um, and now he's become a good friend, you know. Um, it's just, you know, Bailey Howell, the great Mississippi State basketball player who went on and played for championship teams and is in the International Basketball Hall of Fame. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I loved, I love, I love to watch Mississippi athletes do really well. Uh, uh, we, we've got plenty of them now, as you know. I want to ask, um, did you look at any other colleges other than Southern Miss to attend, or was Southern Miss just your one and only choice? Well, the the deal was uh, I was I already had a good job mm -hmm. okay. uh, at the Hattiesburg American. If I kept as long as I kept a three point average at Southern Miss, it didn't cost anything. Um, my I had the the sports information at Ole Miss at the time. Sports information director at Ole Miss at the time was Billy Gates. And the sports information director at uh, Mississippi State was a, a gentleman named Bob Hartley. And they both offered me like half scholarships to come and work in their offices and go to school at those yeah. places at, at State and Ole Miss. Uh, but I, I already had a job. I was doing pretty well at it. Uh, and I could go for free at uh, – at, at Southern Miss, so that's that's pretty that, that was pretty much a done deal. I applied for the Grantland Rice Scholarship at um, at Vanderbilt, uh, which was wow. a full ride at Vanderbilt. But you know, I told you I wasn't that good at biology and French and mm -hmm. subjects like that, and I think I I, I kind of missed out because of that. <laughs> But I, I I did get a letter from them that they have um, that I had been under strong consideration, and and I found out later that the person that got the scholarship that year is a guy whose name you'll recognize, uh, Skip Bayless. <laughs> wow! That's I, I don't, I don't, I'll be honest with you. I'm not sure I would have gone. I'm, not, I'm, I'm at the. I, I might have stayed. Uh, I, I'm not sure I was ready for that anyway. But but I but I, I I took the free ride and I'm you know I, as I said I had to keep a three point average which is a you know just a solid B average and uh, one 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 semester I got my grades and that was a two point seven five and I showed my grades to my dad and he he uh, took out a sheet of paper and wrote down the a name and a number and he said here's here's my banker go get along <laughs> so i didn't miss it again <laughs> uh, the message got through what was the landscape like uh in college how did how was how much of a difference was it for you from high school to college well uh as I say, I had grown up on campus. So, uh, you know, what I love so much about college was that you could pick the classes, you know, right. you, had your, you had a few required classes, but mostly you got to pick them and you got to pick the things you liked. So I, I, uh, that, that was great. Um, uh, um, you know, I'm, I, 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 I did, I had a great college experience. I'm, uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't change much about it. Uh, uh, it, it wasn't a, it wasn't a really hard uh, transformation for me at all. When you are looking at, well, I'll ask you that. I ask, I want to ask, do you feel like Hattiesburg and where you're at at that time is where you want to be forever? Or are you just kind of living in the moment? You know, I didn't think I wanted to be there forever. 
um, uh, as a matter of fact, when I first, when I graduated from Southern, I got, uh, I got several job offers elsewhere, um, including, um, including one at Orlando, which was a really good Orlando Sentinel, which is a really, really good newspaper and was doing great things at the time. Um, but the, at the time, um, I was already the sports editor of the, of the Hattiesburg American and I had built a staff. We had five, we had a five person staff for a small community newspaper and we were winning a bunch of awards and stuff. Wow. And, uh, I didn't want to leave. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, the one year that I've spent outside of Mississippi, I got offered the job as the sports editor over two newspapers, uh, in Monroe, Louisiana. And I went there for a year and that was, that would have been 1978. And I had been there for a year and a, a, a really good job opened up at the Clarion Ledger in Jackson. And I was at the national uh, sports editors meeting, which that year happened to be in Minneapolis. And the sports editor at the Clarion Ledger offered me a job to come back to, uh, to uh, Jackson. And, and, and it was a good writing job. It wasn't managing other people. And at that time, that's what I wanted to do. So I, I came back to Jackson. I've, I've, I've been here ever since. Uh, I, I've had, a, I've, you know, I've had lots of job, job offers um, in other states, other places at bigger newspapers. But uh, I don't know. I just always felt like um, I would be giving up so much in mm -hmm. terms of, of, of knowledge and a sense of place um uh, and um a chance to make a bigger difference here than i would make starting out somewhere else um uh, that I, I just always in the end and then there then there became family situation i mean my wife had a great job here um uh, so we, we i just <clears throat> this has been home um uh, yeah. Um, had one job offered to cover the Yankees. I, did, uh, I, didn't, <laughs> I, I thought about that one pretty hard, uh, but they happened to, it happened. Uh, my interview happened during the winter and I went up there and I decided maybe I might want to <laughs> stay here. <laughs> I want to ask you, uh, because you talked about your father uh, growing up, he was traveling so much. Uh, how much have you traveled? Like, where, do you always travel in state or is it out of state sometimes? How much did you travel throughout your work? I've traveled a great deal. Um, you know, mostly around the South. Uh, mm -hmm. um, I've, I've traveled a lot also because my wife was the, uh, was the director of international marketing for the state for, wow. 30 something years. So we, I mean, I've also traveled around the world, uh, with, with her, um, uh, but work wise, you know, Atlanta, Dallas, uh, Tuscaloosa, Gainesville, uh, all the spots in the SEC, yeah. um, most, mostly that, uh, you know, occasionally, um, for regional NCAA regional basketball tournaments and final fours and stuff, uh, other parts of the country. Uh, but mostly, mostly in the deep South. What was it like for you becoming a father and embracing that role as not being, you know, just you anymore, but being, a, but having a dad role, what was that like for you? Oh man. Uh, great, greatest thing ever happened to me um uh, my uh, uh i had a i had a son who is now 30 
Let's see, now I'm 36 years old and my daughter's 33. Um, um, you know, it becomes the most, you, you know, it, suddenly your whole focus in life changes. I mean, they become, you know, you, you, you just, what you, you've always been thinking about you or just you and your wife. And then all of a sudden there's a whole nother universe <laughs> it's, and it, and that become, I mean, I coached them both in, in little league and little girls, softball, basketball, all that stuff. Exactly. Uh, uh, you know, made sure they were exposed to the, the things that I thought had been good for me growing up, you know, same type books, same, same, uh, uh, everything they, um, and my son has become a, he does, he's a sports writer. My daughter was an actress, uh, for, uh, 10 years she's a stage stage actress in Chicago and when the pandemic came and the um, theaters went dark she's uh, decided to take the LSAT and she as I as I knew she would she knocked it out of the park now she's a second year law student at Tulane um, so uh, we it just changed. It's been, it's been life changing. And the greatest, if my greatest uh, achievement ever is raising two good kids, you know. I love to hear that. Um, that is a field of being a father that, you know, it doesn't really get talked about a lot sometimes. And just for you to embrace it that much, it means a lot. So well, you know that we had the Title IX program, and I didn't, it, it, I didn't get into much of the personal life mm -hmm. things that Title IX has shown me. But you know, I had a son first, but then when I had a daughter, I wanted her to have every, yeah, every opportunity my my son had, and and uh, um, it's been, you know, and. and you know, she wasn't, she wasn't a great athlete, but she played and she tried and they, and they you know, uh, you, you learn lessons. In my opinion, you learn lessons in sports. You don't get anywhere else. You learn, you know, mostly, mostly you learn how to fail. Mm. You, you learn, you know, obviously you learn that hard work leads to success, but you learn how to deal with failure. And, and both of my, both, uh, both my kids got that. As I did. And my son couldn't hit a curve either. <laughs> um, was there ever any writer or journalist that you kind of looked at particularly um, to gain knowledge or gain a lot of advice from their word? Yeah. Yeah. There, there were a couple. Uh, when I was, well, my, there was my dad, obviously, but, but, as far as when when I was growing up and learning the craft, the two two people, uh, we took five newspapers, as I said, at my house, but I, we, I couldn't get the New York papers and I couldn't get the LA papers. And there was a sports writer uh, in New York named Red Smith. And uh, he wrote columns uh, First for the, uh, what was in the, I think the New York Tribune, but it, by the time I was reading him, he was writing for New York Times. And he was just wonderful, just a wonderful writer. His, his columns were more like essays and um, I, I, I read him every chance I could get. And then there was a writer at the LA Times named Jim Murray. And he was hilarious. I mean, he 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 wrote with more humor uh, than any any other sports writer at the time. And uh, so those were the two that impacted me more than any one else. I remember in uh, God, I was twenty two years old, and somehow got elected 
this was 1974 and uh, somehow was voted Mississippi Sports Writer of the Year. And uh, they, my newspaper sent me to North Carolina for the awards program. And I met Red Smith and uh, Jim Murray. And it was like, it was like a, a, being a baseball fan and going somewhere and meeting Mickey Mantle and Willie Mays. Uh, uh, I'll never forget that as long as I live. But, but uh, yeah, those were, those were probably, as far as sports writers, the two most influential. Uh, there was a guy named, uh, a writer for Sports Illustrated uh, named Frank DeFord, who later got into... Uh, radio and tv uh and he was i would say was another guy that i i won't say that i tried to emulate but or imitate but i sure enjoyed reading his stuff uh, this is something that i didn't get a chance to ask you at the title nine event but it, it was something that stuck out to me when every single one of you were talking and it's something that i talk about very impactfully is le leaving a legacy um and i just want to ask you know you've done so much in mississippi um won so many awards are you aware like of the impact that you have made on sports writing in mississippi like a hundred years from now somebody would talk about your life your story to teach it in a class are you aware of what you've done and how important it has been to just the writing in the state of mississippi well, that's very kind of you to say that I'm not sure a hundred years, uh, maybe, maybe 20, 20 years or 30 years. I don't know, but I, you know, I, that's why I stayed here. That's why I stayed in Mississippi is because I thought I could, couldn't, I could make a difference. Um, uh, and if, if to the degree I have, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm proud. I'm, pr I'm proud of that. Uh, you know, it's hard. It's hard to think of yourself when your sports writer is making a great big difference. I mean, there's been a few things I know that I helped do. Um, uh, I mean, I was part of the group that actually established the Mississippi Sports Hall of Fame. I mean, we'd always had a Hall of Fame that had that where we had we inducted people, but we didn't have anything we were really inducting them into. There was not a building. There wasn't a uh, and, and was part of that in the 1990s, there was a group of people, Archie Manning was involved in it as well. Um, uh, Michael Rubenstein, who was a great sports writer, I mean, sports caster here in Jackson, um, uh, and, uh, several other people said, uh, uh, politicians and everybody, but that, that was some, one of the things I'm proudest of is in, in 1984, when Jerry Rice and Willie Totten were playing at Mississippi Valley and, and, uh, uh, Marino Chasm was the coach at, uh, Alcorn and both teams were undefeated in, in, uh, the early season when we're beating everybody really badly, uh, and they were supposed to play in November in, in, uh, Itabina. And I wrote a column in mid October that said that the game should be moved to Jackson and played here where instead of eight or 10,000 people, which is what they sat at Valley, you know, you could have 64,000 here. And it turned out there was a double header here that, that Saturday. So I wrote another column saying, well, let's just play it on Sunday. And they did it, and it became the largest payday in the history of either school, and the large, the most, the most highly attended game in in football game in Mississippi history. You know, we sent a hell. I was at the at the Jackson. I was a sports editor of the Jackson Papers at the time, and we hired a helicopter to take a photo from above the stadium, yeah. of the stadium. And you can't even see where the aisles were were because people wow. were sitting and standing in the aisles mm -hmm. to watch the game. Uh, it's one of the greatest days in Mississippi sports history. And I, you know, I, I played a big role in that. Um, but I'm, you know, it's, it's been, 
you know, it's, it's been fun to write about the legends and, and to hopefully maybe educate some people about how, how good we are at, at, at what is a sports or let's face it. Sports are a big part of our social fabric here mm -hmm. in Mississippi. Uh, it's something we do really well. There are a lot of things we don't do well, <laughs> but there's, but that's one of the things we do really well. And, and, and it's, it's, uh, I've enjoyed every bit of it. I would love to ask you when you're writing stories, uh, is there anything specifically that you make sure is maybe the most important? Like, is the imagery, the, you know, something that you kind of focus on sometimes? Is the header of the story most important sometimes? Like, when you're writing, what is it that you kind of focus on? Or do you kind of just try to blend it all together and make sure every piece is as best as possible? My, my, my first let me, I'll give you a story that will kind of tell you what, uh, when, when I, when I was that first game I covered down at Brooklyn, Brooklyn versus Loosedale, I got back home and back then we wrote on a typewriter, you know, and so mm -hmm. I rolled up clean white paper into my typewriter at the kitchen table in our house on 26th Avenue. And my, my, my daddy left you know, had taken me to the game and brought me home and he just left me alone there in the kitchen. Um, and then he came back in about 30 minutes later to check on me and that, that paper was still clean and white. There was nothing on it. And he, he, he said, he said something like, what's wrong, Dub? What, 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 are you, are you going to write? And I said, I said, Dad, I don't, I can't get started. I don't know how to get started. And he told me, he said, uh, well, if I were you, I would start to tell, tell it like you were telling it to a friend. Just tell it, write it like you would tell the story to a friend. And uh, it's still the best advice I've ever gotten because you think about it, if you're telling a story to somebody, you try to, you, you want to hook them, you want to get their interest, you want to tell them, you tell them the most important things first, and then you try to continue telling the story in a way that holds their interest. Yeah. And um, I, I, I still use that advice to this day. Uh, and I think the best sports writing there is, 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 is conversational almost. It's you, you're, you're, t you're telling stories, you know, by the time people get to the sports page, they're ready to be entertained a little bit. I think they've read all the bad things that have happened in the world. <laughs> I mean, that's all on the front page. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I try. I try to. After every game, when I'm sitting down and thinking about how I'm going to craft the column, what's the most? I, I ask myself two things: What's the most important thing about this game? What's the most interesting part of this game? If I'm doing a feature story, uh, if I'm doing a feature story, say on Deuce McAllister. Uh, I interview him. I talk to other people about him. I say, I try to decide, well, what's the most interesting thing about him that nobody knows that you can tell people? And I tell that, you know, you try to tell the story that way. You talked about at the beginning, uh, just writing and journalism, when you knew this is what you were going to do. Yeah. And you been awarded so many awards and been recognized for so many different things. And I'm sure that doesn't matter to you, but when you, when you've worked for something for so long, how appreciative are you to be recognized for what you do and how you do it in a way that maybe others may not do it? Oh, it's, you know, it's nice. I mean, it's, you, it's gratifying. It's nice. It's, uh, uh, I, I don't know any other way to put it. It's nice. It's, but it's not, I mean, I, 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 
the more meaningful things are some are notes and letters I've gotten from from wow. people, you know, uh, or or to you know to walk into somebody's house and see where they have a frame piece that you, of something you wrote, you know, or things like that. I mean, I, it's it's nice that I can go to maybe like someplace anywhere in Mississippi, Gulfport, Columbus. Pascagoula and invariably somebody will tell me about something I wrote 15, 20 years ago. Sometimes I don't even remember it. Mm -hmm. But that, you know, to know that you impacted somebody in that way is 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 pretty cool. Um, you know, on the other hand, you got to understand that most of the things you write wrote over your career ended up either in, either in a trash can or to start lighting a fire or to wrap fish. Right. <laughs> they don't call it fish wrap for nothing. This is a fun question that I love to ask, and I'm sure your answer would be very intriguing. Um, if you could have dinner with three people dead or alive, who would they be and why? Oh, boy. Well, Mark Twain would be one of them for sure. I love that. Uh, no question about it. Uh, he's, I love to read Twain and, and, and just how smart and how funny and clever and everything he was. I'm sure he would be the same way at the dinner table. Um, that's a really hard one. Uh, <laughs> maybe Thomas Jefferson, maybe, I don't know, uh, Abraham Lincoln, um, JFK, uh, uh, I don't know, I, 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 I'd love to have Willie Mays at the dinner table. I mean, uh -huh. I, you know, I, I mean, there's so many people. I don't, I don't know if I could, if I could narrow it narrow it down to three you know right now i'd love to have my dad and mom at the dinner table <laughs> uh yeah that's a that, that's a tough one uh, I, the first I, I, for whatever reason the first person that came to mind the first was mark twain have you ever read him no but my grandmother she's a reader and I can tell you what she is devoted to I wouldn't say she's devoted but she's definitely put me on to some Mark Twain words and pieces of advice from his book so I I understand where you're coming from well his is you know his books of course are really really famous but if you ever go back and read some of the essays and stuff he wrote uh and then just some of the if you, you can just go on the internet and google Mark Twain sayings and and just the wit and wisdom and everything that he wrote. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm cra crazy about him. Uh, you know, I, I, it would be a great uh, din dinner for me to just with some of the Mississippians that, that yeah. I've covered. I mean, I'd, mm -hmm. if I could sit down and have dinner with Boo Ferris, you know who Boo was? The, he was, he was a, he was a baseball coach at Delta State who won a, a million games. But before that, he was a pitcher for the Boston Red Sox in the 19, uh, mid-1940s, 45, 46. He was the best pitcher in baseball mm -hmm. from, from, uh, from the Mississippi Delta. Uh, and uh, he, he hurt his shoulder. Uh, in the winter, I mean, in the early in the season of 1947, mm -hmm. it turned out uh, years and years later, he found out it was just a torn labrum. They, they could fix it and he'd be mm -hmm. back as good as new in uh, six months. Back then it was career ending. And uh, I wrote, I wrote a book about him uh, Golly, it's been years ago now, but it it, it we we had to reprint it twice because it it was it really did well. Um, 
but he's one of the greatest human beings I ever met. And uh, uh, if I could have him and Archie Manning and Ralph Boston at the same dinner dinner table, that'd be that'd, that'd be mm -hmm. good enough for me. You know. How has the landscape of sports changed from the time that you remember covering it to now? It's just, you know, the evolution of whatever sports you want to talk about, uh, the speed, the dynamics, the, the analytics. How does, how does sports change for you? Well, I can talk about it. I just wrote a column uh, that was on Mississippi Today. Um, yesterday, it was sparked by the, the, the deal that you attended in, in Oxford last week, the Title IX thing. The, the by far the two biggest changes in the 50 years 50 years and change that I've covered sports in Mississippi are I think number one would be integration mm -hmm. I mean and, you know we're, we're talking about that, that in 1969 there weren't any there weren't any African Americans playing at Ole Miss Mississippi State and Southern Miss Think about that. That's not that long ago. Uh, uh, and so the integration would be number one. And number two would be women in sports. Uh, in 1972, when Title IX came into existence, uh, when, when it was legislation, Mississippi uh mississippi college for women now it's mississippi university for women was the only that was the only place you could go in mississippi if you were a woman to play sports um, since then you know it's become an, an, another big part of our culture delta states won six national basketball championships yeah old miss Coach Joe has it going in women's basketball. They've won a national golf championship. They play really good brand of softball. That uh, you know they've had track and field heroes. Uh, Mississippi State's played in two NCAA championships games in the last ten years in basketball. Mm -hmm. Southern Miss has been to the College World Series in softball. Uh, but but as I said in that column, more importantly literally thousands and thousands of Mississippi young women have gotten their education yeah. paid for by being good at sports. Uh, and, and that wasn't an opportunity they had uh, 51 years ago. Uh, so those have been, those, that, those are the two main ways that, college uh, that 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 sports in mississippi have changed uh, you know it's 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 like any uh, anything else uh the athletes are bigger stronger faster uh in 19 uh you look at a a, a football game program from 1970 when archie was the quarterback at old miss and you'll see that you know the biggest players on the team the giants weigh 245 250 200 you might have one 270 pounder on the team mm. uh, now yeah it's, you, it's rarely you see an offensive lineman who's under 300 mm -hmm. i was looking at i was uh looking at the southern miss starting offensive line um uh, uh, I'm going. Uh, I'm going to watch them play Tulane Saturday night, and I was just looking at over their offensive line, and it's like from tackle to tackle, it's 340, 335, 315, 345, 375. I mean, that's crazy. Uh, and um, so, and, and and they move better. I mean, they're quicker, faster. They're, you know, weight training has been a big part of that. You know, back in the 60s and early 70s, the weight rooms were like what you might find at, at, at your local YMCA. Now you go in there and, my God, it's unbelievable. Uh, so that, 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 that's changed a lot. Uh, 
And of course, money. Yeah. Money has changed everything and not necessarily for the better, in my opinion. Um, but th th those are some of the changes that have occurred. I want to, I don't have too many more questions, but I, I have enjoyed just talking to you. Um, but when you are reporting, when you're at games, I would love to know where, where are you? Like, are you on the field? Are you in the box? And when you're at games, what are you particularly looking for to write about? Well, I'm traditionally in the, in, in the press box at high school. When I go to a high school game, I love to walk the field. Mm -hmm. uh, I love to overhear what the coaches are telling the players. And uh, I like to look back into the stands and see the emotions and everything that's going on. Yeah. So when I have the opportunity, like I did have at the Jackson State Grambling game last Saturday, they don't have the same – um, if you you can get a you can get a press pass that lets you walk the field, so I did that. Um, um, I think the closer you can get to the action, the better. Yes, sir. Um, um, so I do it when I can, but but normally I'm in the press box, and and as I said before, I'm always looking for the most the things that I think will interest readers the most. Uh, uh, you've got, you, and, and I'm also looking for perspective. I mean, what's, what, where does this game fit into the, the whole season? The, uh, why I need to tell the readers why it was important. Um, or why it wasn't, I guess, but, but it, but but I'm always looking for perspective and and, and looking for um, looking for perspective and looking for intrigue. What's intriguing about this game? One of the things that I always end my episodes with is uh, two questions, and I'll ask the first one is simple. Just what piece of advice uh, would you give to people watching? Just anything about anything at all. What, what is one piece of advice that you always would and want to share with other people? You mean with 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 other writers or with just just in general? God, Lee. You mean uh, about what I do or about life? I was uh, about life. I think that's more impactful for people listening. Ah, uh, make a difference. You know, and en en enjoy it. Enjoy it, but make a difference. Make make as big a difference as you can make. And my second question is, what legacy do you want to leave behind? It's not that's something that I always talk about because it's impactful for me to understand for people to understand what I do and why I do it. So, what legacy do you, what do you want people to remember about you? I you know. Uh, that's a that's a tough question. I, I won't. Uh, uh, it'd be nice if people would would remember me and, and say he tried to make Mississippi a better place. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, because I have. I mean that. I mean that's. Uh, you know, there's only there's all only so much impact a sports writer can have on the world, you know. But I but I I want I want to try to leave it. Uh, I want to try to leave the place better than I found it. Um, and that's. I guess that, uh, that, that'd be a pretty good way to put it. Just leave it better than you found it. He left it better than he found it. That would be, that would, that would suit me just fine. I love that a lot. I love that a lot, Mr. Cleveland. Uh, one more thing is something that I'm passionate about is music. And I love to give people's different intels on what kind of music they listen to, uh, what kind of music they grew up on. So what are some of the, the artists or genres that maybe you, you spend your time a lot listening to. Man, I, I I'm 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 with you on that. I'm I like 
uh, I, I, I guess you'd say I'm multifaceted on music. I like good music. I yeah. like uh, at our at our house. Uh, I'll tell you a, a good example. On uh, we're not big church goers, but on Sunday morning we listen to. There's two albums we listen to. One of them's the Blind Boys of Alabama. Do you know them? No, sir, I don't. Well, they're it's a gospel group mm -hmm. uh, from Alabama, uh, African American, who sing gospel music, spiritual. Check it out. Check it I out. Do. Blind Boys of Alabama. Google it. Listen to it. You'll you'll love it. I, I think you'll love it. Uh, and we and and, the, and then Willie Ma Willie Nelson and his sister have a gospel album we listen to on Sunday morning, uh, and that pre pretty and and we listen to a lot of Motown, uh, we listen to a lot of rock and roll. Mm -hmm. There's uh, it's it's not called uh, I I can't stand today's country music you hear on country music stations, but I love old stuff i love uh uh hank williams senior i love uh, uh i love to listen to uh willie nelson um uh, uh, i love it um love 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 motown music um my my wife is crazy about aretha so we listen to a lot of aretha franklin um uh, I like Aretha Franklin. Mm -hmm. I love the movie about her. Did you see that? And yes, sir. Uh, so I, yeah, I'm. I'm. It's a big part of our lives. Uh, it's something. Something always playing at our house. Uh, so I'm a Springsteen. As far as live music, I guess I've seen Springsteen 20, 25 times. Uh, crazy about it his music so much energy uh and 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 he's an un un he's an underappreciated writer i think and and then yeah, i love bob dylan too yeah uh i even worked a line from bob dylan into my column yesterday so <laughs> yeah so that that pretty well covers what I, I when people ask me what kind of music i like i say i like good music Mm -hmm. I like Mozart. Occasionally, I'll just when I'm 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 a big walker. I used to be a runner. My knees won't let me run so much anymore. So I'm I walk 30, 35 miles a week, uh, and I I use earphones and I, I'm usually listening to music. And sometimes it's sometimes it's Mozart, and uh, sometimes it's Springsteen, and sometimes it's Dylan, and sometimes it's Motown. I just like good music. I love that. I love that a lot. Um, Mr. Cleveland, uh, I wanted to say thank you for sharing your, your story with me this morning um, and just giving me your contact information to even talk to you. I've enjoyed learning from you, and I hope I can continue to grow and learn from you as well. Well, I appreciate your interest, man. And, and um, uh, But you need to, we, we need to make a deal right now. You're going to call me Rick. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir, Rick. <laughs> okay, there you go. And I have a I have a good friend. His name is Jim Harris. He's about 64, 65, and he works for the Arkansas Gaming and Fish Commission back home. And I got a chance to interview him. He told me the same thing. He, he said, Don't call me Mr. Harris anymore, Dale. And he said, only Jim now. So I, I get I get that a lot. So yes, sir. Here's, that's good. Here's the deal with me. When somebody says Mr. Cleveland, I keep looking around for my daddy. <laughs> but but you're 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 uh, you're old enough, and uh, and I hope we'll continue the friendship, and I hope you'll call me Rick. I will, Rick. Thank you. Uh, it it means a lot to. I, I mean I mean that seriously for you to just spend time and talking with me, and just even allow me to talk to you and learn from you. So I appreciate it a lot. Thank you. Well, I enjoy it. You, are you going to – this doesn't have to be part of the show. I'm just wondering, do you go to the games now? Are you covering Yes, them? sir. Uh, I'm not covering yet. Um, that is definitely something I am 
looking forward to getting into soon. Not yet, but I've definitely been at every game so far, uh, at least the home games. I wasn't there last week, but I've definitely been at every game. Well, I'll see you. I'll see you. Maybe uh, I'm not I, so far. I don't know what's going to be the first one I get to. I might I might make the Kentucky game, which is going to be a huge game.